Well, if you would, grab a Bible near you and pick up the letter uh, to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. That's where we are, and we began, a, I guess, a series last week, if you want to call it that. It's really just one long message in two parts. Uh, we were calling it Fire and Form, and this is born out of a personal desire of mine and I hope a desire of many of you, and that is that we see God move in a really, really powerful way in 2022, just we're asking for renewal, asking for revival, asking for God to do something, something amazing in the life of Johnson Ferry this year, that lives are transformed forever. And I was given this idea in a book that I read, and I read this quote last week, and I'll read it again to you this week. And a gentleman by the, Mark, by the name of Mark Sayers said this. He said, the church and followers of Jesus are called to be human temples, and that's an image we used last week. And here's what he says about temples. Temples are built around form and fire. Their forms direct our patterns of worship and our hearts toward God, reshaping true worshipers in God's image. Temples are also places of fire, where fire is used to consume sacrifices, cleansing and purifying us. Fire also symbolizes God's presence and power. And as we talked about last week, you need both. There's some of you that you're chasing fire. You love that idea of just God's presence and would you just come down and do something awesome and we want fire and I, and I love that. I'm, I'm with you on that. But we also need form. We need patterns, habits, rituals. We're gonna look at that today. And the reality is some of you want fire and you're a little bit less excited about form. Some of you really love form and habits and rituals, maybe a little bit less excited about fire, but the reality is that we need both because we as the body of Christ, are a temple unto the Lord. And that image of temple and priests and all that is found in 1 Peter. We're looking at just two simple verses, and I'll read them for us, and I hope you'll follow along in just a minute because I'm gonna give you some things to write down in your notes. But let's pick up where we left off last week, same two verses, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses four and five. Here's what the Bible says. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, so this is me and you as believers, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So much to unpack there, but this image that, that as Christ is the living stone, we are living stones. We looked at that last week. As Jesus is the high priest, we in some ways are a priesthood unto him. And, and here's where we're gonna camp out today, that very last part of verse five. It says that as priests, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now that's imagery we don't tend to use because we think about Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross, which of course he did as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But even on this side of the cross, as followers of Jesus, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And that whole idea of spiritual sacrifices is where we're gonna attach what we said earlier about form. Now, when we think about form, Here's, here's what I think about. Uh, form are patterns, habits, disciplines, rituals that shape us. They determine the health and the growth of our lives in the way of Jesus. Now, we make all kinds of decisions based on all kinds of different factors. I heard about this study a couple years ago. I thought this was really fascinating. There were a bunch of seminary students at Princeton uh, Divinity School, Princeton Seminary. And they were given this task that they were gonna preach a sermon on the Good Samaritan. You know that story, right? The guy's built, I mean, he's beat up on the side of the road and the Good Samaritan comes and helps him. And the moral of the story is, like Jesus, uh, we should help those who are in front of us. Whoever has a need, that's who, we, that's who our neighbor is, according to the parable. Well, in this certain like, social experiment, they were given this task to preach this sermon and they were gonna walk from one building to another building at a certain time to preach the sermon. Well, on the way, there was this man in between the two rooms that was obviously in need, kind of writhing in pain, obvious needed someone to help him. And what's amazing in this little social experiment is that the majority of the students who were preaching on the Good Samaritan did not stop to help the man on their way to talk about how we should help stop 
and help people, which, which is just amazing to me. Um, and here's what it says. It says that they knew the right thing to do, but that moment, what they were more concerned about was the pressure of the time to be in the place they were assigned to be to do the task they were assigned to do. And, and what that tells me is that all of us, every single one of us, we have things we know we should do, but we are often directed by subconscious things, things that we don't even think about, deeper long, longings and feelings and desires. And, 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 and like me, you probably know that people can take advantage of this. In fact, this is what marketers do, right? I mean, they set up um, different ways to get inside and hack your brain, right? They, they even call this neuro uh, marketing. Uh, this idea that, that I'm gonna tap into your deeper longings because that's what you wanna do. And so we, so we make all kinds of decisions. I mean, think about this. We make all kinds of decisions based on impulses that we don't always know how to articulate, but we think them, we feel them. They're, they're, they're a part of us. So like this time of year, a lot of you, let's admit it, a lot of you, a couple weeks ago, you saw that ad and you saw those really happy, skinny people enjoying their 4% body fat on that new thing that you had to buy because this is a year you're gonna lose that weight and you bought it, right? You saw the commercial, you bought it and, and you did it for like a week. I mean, you, you did it, right? And, and now, now that thing is the most expensive clothes hanger you have ever bought, right? Because, because there was something in you that saw that and you had to have it, this, this impulse. Or social media, there's another one. A lot of you right now, you struggle, let's be honest, you struggle to go 10 minutes without looking at your device. Why? Because you, you are, yes, addicted to it, but there's something in you that's driving you to that, to that habit. I mean, whatever it is, we all have these desires that often drive us to do things. Sometimes we don't even wanna do those things, these habits that are formed. I, I love what one, um, uh, I think is a teacher of philosophy, certainly of theology, his name is James K.A. Smith. In this book, You Are What You Love, I love this quote. He says, we are orientated by our longings, directed by our desires. We adopt ways of life that are indexed to such visions of the good life, not usually because we think through our options, but because we feel them. Uh, we live in a culture that rewards temporary feelings and desires and impulses. And we're gonna get to the whole spiritual sacrifice thing, but what I wanna convey to you today is that the way that we fight that as those living in the way of Jesus is that we adopt, well, we adopt an attitude of discipleship, of following Jesus, of going a different way than the world is going. I love what Eugene Peterson says about discipleship. He calls it a long obedience in the same direction. I love that. Because let's be honest, Jesus Christ gave us as his disciples the command to go and not only be his disciples, but to make disciples of all the nations. And so here's the big question. Here's the big question. Are we discipling the nations or are the nations discipling us? I mean, let's just back up. When we begin a relationship with Jesus, we understand that he died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the grave. We might have a new life in him. And when that happens and we repent of our sin and we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified, we are born again, we're given a new life, but that is not the end of the journey. Some people treat like, that's it, like, okay, I'm into heaven, I'm good to go, Let, let's go, Jesus. But the reality is that is not the end, that's the beginning of the journey of this walking with Jesus and, 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 and understanding who he is and, and being his apprentice and following him and and displaying the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit and all, all that is walking in the way of Jesus. But we also live in a world that has its own way of walking and its own habits and its own desires. And so we have this conflict of do I walk in the way of Jesus, do I walk in the way of the world? And sometimes, let's be honest, we can even carry all the ways of the world into, well, into the church. I thought about some of the, the ways that, that the ways of the world kind of, well, to kind of follow us into the body of Christ, like consumerism. How many of us come in here and you're thinking the whole time, what's in it for me? How does this fit my preferences, my desires? I'm like that, you're like that. That's something we have to fight against. How about this commitment? We don't like to commit to things. People don't like to commit to organizations, institutions. People don't like to commit to church. 
even before COVID, there were a lot of people struggling just to, just to be here when that is part of what it means to follow Jesus, to be a part of the body of Christ, commitment. Uh, we, we look more like the world when we trade the gospel for political correctness and kind of our progressive, secularist worldview that, that's very prevalent and, and we tend to, to kind of soften the edges of the gospel to kind of fit our cultural mold. And, and we do that, we look more like the world than we do in the way of Jesus. Or, or we trade in the gospel for political advocacy. And I think there's a lot of good things about, about government. It's called a service, a, a minister of God. But let's be honest, if, if we're more pumped about, about some political thing than we are about the nature of Christ and the gospel and the mission he's given to us, then we, we look more like the world than we do the body of Christ. We, we could go on and on, but you get the point. I, I'm saying that we all are in this tug of war, this wrestling match between the ways of the world and the way of Jesus. So that gets us to our point. Peter says that as living stones, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. And I believe in these sacrifices, we discover the way of Jesus, disciplines, patterns, rhythms that help us to walk in the way of Jesus. So what I wanna do is just go through these really quick. We won't take a whole long time, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, I wanna think about five spiritual sacrifices. And it's, this is an interesting Bible study I'd, I'd love for you to do. Maybe you can do it after you log off of here. Just look up the phrase spiritual sacrifice in the New Testament, and you're gonna see a lot of what we talk about today and a few more. This, this is what Peter's talking about. This is what living in the form, the way of Jesus looks like. So let's go through these. Five spiritual sacrifices that we are to offer as priests of the way of Jesus. All right, number one. Number one is my prayers, my prayers. And we talked a lot about this last week, so I probably don't need to say a whole lot this week. But one of the ways that we offer sacrifice to God is by just learning to pray and connect with our Heavenly Father through prayer. Listen to this amazing image from Revelation chapter eight. Uh, listen to this. It says, another angel, because I know all the Revelation language is kind of confusing, but just listen to this. Another angel with a gold incense burner came up and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the Lord. I mean, think about that. Our prayers, like in this bowl, <laughs> you know, on an altar, and the smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. I love that picture, that when we pray to God, it's a, it's a spiritual sacrifice uh, that is pleasing to him. And I think that's a discipline for us. This last week, our staff began a staff prayer time. And I, I told them the same thing I think is true for, for me personally and for us as a church, that this is a discipline. Like this needs to be normal, that we gather to pray together and that we're seeking the heart of God and, and praying uh, prayers that, that bring glory to God. So my prayers are a spiritual sacrifice. So how's your prayer life, really? Your prayers are a sacrifice to God. All right, number two. Number two, my body, my body. There was an early heresy in the New Testament called Gnosticism, and I won't go into all that that means, but practically speaking, they believed that your uh, soul was good, but your body was bad. And so the practical outworkings of that was that as long as your soul was good before the Lord, your, your body was allowed to do certain sinful practices. And, and notice how different that is from the way of Jesus, because the way of Jesus encompass, encompasses everything about you. Romans chapter 12, classic verse. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is the spiritual service of worship. In the Old Testament, when they sacrificed an animal, nothing was withheld. The animal's life was given. That's the image for us, that our whole life is to be given to the Lord. But he uses this interesting phrase, we are not dead sacrifices, we're living sacrifices. It's like being a living son, we're living sacrifices. Two words that don't go together. To still be alive, to still get up, go to work, to still coach your son's soccer team, to still, all those things we do, living, 
but we live as a sacrifice. I think it was Richard Foster who said, um, the problem with living sacrifices is that they're always trying to crawl off the altar. And that's true of me, that's true for you. But what the point of this is to say, there's no part of my life, not one part of my life, that is not sacrificed to the Lord. He can have it all. That should be our attitude. Very practically, my, my feet, where are they going? Do the places that I go, you go, they glorify God. How about our eyes? What do we look at on a daily basis? What kinds of content, what are, what are we putting before our eyes is that, is that a sacrifice to God? My hands, where am I serving? Uh, the mission of Christ, the body of Christ, the way of Jesus. Where am I, what about you? Where are you serving with your hands, your heart? What do you love? Really, what, what, do you, what do you love? What do you get passionate about? You know, we get passionate about all kinds of things. I mean, this last week, a lot of you Georgia fans, you got passionate about your team winning. And I think that's awesome. That's incredible. As a South Carolina fan, I don't know what that feels like, right? So I think it's incredible. But let's be honest. I mean, sometimes we get way more passionate about football than we do about Jesus. But I mean, what do I love, really? Seriously, what do I love? Uh, my brain, how am I allowing my mind to be transformed by Christ? My mouth, well, that's one. What, what's coming out of this mouth? Maybe a, another way, what am, I, what am I typing, you know, on my device? But you get the whole point. My body, everything I am, is a sacrifice to the Lord. How about you? All right, number three, my praise, my praise. In Hebrews chapter 13, we see that phrase again, spiritual sacrifice. Notice what it says there. Through him then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips praising his name. Did you know that worship is a discipline? Yes, it's an experience, but it's also a discipline. Both corporately, that's why we gather together in worship. That's why that there are times we have to do what we're doing right now to accommodate some unique weather patterns. But the, the norm of what we are to do is to gather together to worship together, and that's true corporately, but also just personally. Am I developing a discipline of worship and praise to God? Not just singing, but just, just praising God. And here's the deal, look, praising God is easy when things are good and when things are easy, right? I mean, that, that's, that's when it's easy to praise God, but when it's a discipline, when it's a sacrifice, is when you are praising God in the midst of that awful medical report. You're praising God in the midst of the crisis you're going through. You're praising God in the midst of the trial. That I mean, A lot of you right now are in a trial and this is when you need to develop the discipline, the sacrifice of praising Jesus because he is worth it no matter what you're going through. And that's a sacrifice of praise that's acceptable to God. Did you know it brings God joy when he sees you praise him in the midst of what you're going through, we are to offer praise as a sacrifice to the Lord. All right, number four. Number four is my witness. Again, what we're doing here, we're, we're just looking where we see the phrase spiritual sacrifice in the New Testament. And these are the forms. This is the way that we live out the way of Jesus. My witness. Romans chapter 15 but I've written very boldly to you on some point so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. This is what Paul said. Ministering as a priest, there's that language, as a priest, the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Like all these people he was reaching with the gospel, he considered a sacrifice to God. Lord, Lord, I can't save them, you can, but I'm offering up these people to you as a sacrifice, my witness. Sometimes I've heard people say that you can't take anything to heaven with you. And did you know that's not true? Because there is one thing that you can take to heaven with you. It's people. It's people. Look, I, I know the deal. We don't save them. I'm not the Holy Spirit. You're not the Holy Spirit. But when we share the gospel with people who aren't yet followers of Jesus, who are living in sin, living, deserving God's wrath, living separated from God, in lostness, 
when we share the gospel with them and see them converted by the Holy Spirit in the most miraculous way, they, they, are, they are a spiritual sacrifice to God. And I'll be honest with you, I love a lot of what's happening in our church. I think over this last year or two, through all the craziness, we've seen God do some amazing things. But one of the key areas that we have to really develop as a church family is, the, is this sharing the gospel with lost people and just having a burden for your neighbor, a burden for your coworker, a burden for your family member, and, and just because that is a sacrifice to the Lord. That's why we're here, to share the gospel with people. That's what we're called to do. And that needs to be on the top of our priority list, reaching people with the gospel. That needs to come before almost anything else we do as a church family. That's one thing I'm really excited about this upcoming vision next week because so much of it is just, it's just the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission that we're called to do. I can't wait to share that with you. I, I love uh, D.L. Moody. You know that is? The white Lyman Moody, like an old evangelist from the, I think, late 1800s. This guy came up to him and was complaining to him about evangelism. He just didn't like the way that he maybe thought D.L. Moody was a little pushy or aggressive. I, I don't know what it was. He said, Mr. Moody, I don't like the way that you do evangelism. And Mr. Moody, Mr. Moody excuse me, being humble, said, all right, well, how do you do evangelism? The guy basically got around to saying, well, I don't. <laughs> and I love what D.L. Moody said. Well, I like the way I do evangelism better than the way you don't do evangelism. And, I, and I'll be honest, what about you? Like, how are you sharing the gospel with people regularly as a, as, a, as a sacrifice to God, living in the way of Jesus. All right, I did four. Here's the last one. We'll wrap it up with this. Your favorite topic, my money. I know you love talking about that, my money. But that's what it is. In fact, there's two verses I wanna mention to you that talk about money as a sacrifice, a spiritual sacrifice unto the Lord. Philippians 4.18 is the first one. Paul said, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They, these gifts, financial gifts, are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Also in Hebrews 13, 16, it says, and do not forget to do good and share with others. The implication is financially sharing with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It's just a good reminder that I'm a steward of the resources that God has given to me, and I need to be generous with those resources to God, to his work, and to helping meet the needs of people. I wanna just say thank you to you as a church family for how incredibly generous that you have been uh, this last year. Uh, God has been so faithful through your giving, and we are so appreciative and can't wait to, to see how God uses those resources to reach more people with the gospel. So, but our money is a sacrifice to the Lord. And if you haven't given through worship today, I wanna encourage you to do that as an act of spiritual sacrifice, pleasing to Jesus. Well, what we're talking about today, and we'll wrap it up here, is just this idea that if we're gonna be followers of Jesus, yes, we need fire, we need his presence, but we also have to live a certain way and discipline our lives in a certain way to be used by him. I think there's probably no greater example than, than thinking about athletics when you think about discipline. I think about someone like Steph Curry, the greatest three-point shooter in NBA history, one of the greatest basketball players ever. And you see him make these amazing shots for the Golden State Warriors, but what you may not know is that he makes the discipline that, that, that he makes 500 shots every single day. Every single day. That's one of his disciplines, that he's gonna put up and make 500 different shots every single day. Even on game days, he's gonna make sure he makes two to 300 shots per day. And I think that's true of a great athlete. What's it mean for us as we develop disciplines to walk in the way of Jesus? I hope and pray as we go into this year, 2022, that yes, we will pursue the fire of God, but it will be met with this rigorous form of living in the way of Jesus so that we might see God do something amazing with his people here. I hope you enjoy the rest of today, know that we love you, and know that if we can help you, please reach out to the church. We'd love to help you in any way. We'll be praying for you. I wanna encourage you to come this next week as we begin this great vision series. And I hope and pray that you'll take what you heard today 
and put it into practice as you live in the way of Jesus. Let me pray for you, and then after that, we will sign off. Father, thank you so much for you. Thank you for this technology that allows us to just minister in this way as we have today. I pray your blessings on everyone that's watching this right now. God, would you use us all, Lord, both with fire and form to be yours. We love you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.